Thank you, uh, Alex. And uh, let's see if we can switch over. Uh, so it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Sue Whitfield uh, Gabrielli. Uh, she is a colleague of the Martino Center, but the Martino Center at MIT. And as we heard earlier, she comes to us from uh, Stanford, uh, where she did some of the seminal work on uh, pediatric functional neuroimaging. Uh, and before that, uh, she spent some time at the uh, UC Berkeley in the Lawrence Livermore Lab. Um, so she's really has a tremendous amount of experience uh, in fMRI analysis, is a wonderful teacher. I always love hearing her lectures. And uh, without further ado, Sue. Thanks so much for that kind introduction. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here at this monumental event. And um, I've been really excited about all of the presentations I've heard. I'm going to shift gears a little bit um, from the previous three topics, um, uh, which we're really talking about how neuroimaging could augment uh, neurology, and shift that a little bit in terms of how neuroimaging may be able to augment psychi psychiatric uh, treatment. So for each advance in human brain mapping methods, um, we, have a, we potentiate new insights into the human brain function. And um, you can go from lesions to PET, to DTI, MRI, and fMRI. And today I'll be focusing primarily on the intrinsic functional architecture of the human brain as elucidated by resting state fMRI and, and explain how I believe that this actually ha holds great hope for clinical translation. So if you were to go to PubMed and actually just search on some of the major psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, and search on uh, papers related to fMRI, you might get about 20,000 hits. And all of those papers have provided great insights into brain differences in psychiatric disorders. However, this knowledge hasn't really fundamentally altered patient diagnosis or treatment, except for a few rare excep exceptions like TMS and deep brain simulation. So we know that there's great challenges in psychiatric disorders, ideology is unknown, diagnosis are still primarily based on symptoms, detection is often late, often uh, it's done by crisis, and treatments are often done by trial and error, even though we know that there's great patient heterogeneity in treatment response. Um, also, treatments like antidepressants and antipsychotics often have negative side effects. Uh, they're only partially effective, and consequently, there's a high attrition. But I believe now we may be to the point where we can use fMRI and resting state fMRI to actually address some of these fundamental challenges in psychiatric disorders, uh, specifically the ones that I have highlighted here in yellow. So today I'll talk a little bit um, about resting state networks. Randy Buckner has given a beautiful introduction already. Um, I'll focus specifically on the default mode network, talk a little bit about the functional associations of the DMN with the self-reference network as well as executive function, because I think understanding those functional associations may potentiate an interpretation of what a functional pathology of the DMN might mean in the case of neuropsychiatric disorders. So then I'll turn a little bit to um, schizophrenia. I'll talk about how the DMN uh, um, has pathology in schizophrenia, but I'll also talk about how maybe if the DMN has pathology in schizophrenia, maybe we can modulate this default mode network with novel behavioral interventions, um, such as real-time fMRI neurofeedback. And then I'll shift gears a little bit and talk about how we can use resting state networks, for instance, the default mode network, for early identification. If we can uh, identify early, we could potentially um, have early intervention and even potentially prevention of a disorder. And then finally, I'll shift gears and talk about how we can use resting state networks in the context of neuroprediction. In other words, could we get a resting state network and be able to predict who is going to respond to a particular treatment? And this, of course, is geared toward personalized or precision medicine. So it was back in 1995 that Brat Biswell made his seminal finding where he showed that the regions of the brain that were functionally correlated to the motor cortex during rest uh, looked very similar to the task activation that you would get with bilateral finger tapping. So in other words, the regions of the brain that rise and fall in temporal synchrony during rest constitute what we call resting state networks. And these are intrinsic spontaneous low frequency fluctuations in fMRI bold signal um, that exhibit these networks uh, without any task whatsoever. And there's many different clinical characteristics um, that make them relevant for clinical translation. One of the most obvious ones, of course, is there's no task. And that's actually really important. There's no task and they're very, very fast and easy to acquire. And that means that we can bypass all um, behavioral differences in task performance, which is actually key. And it also makes it accessible to pediatric populations, including infants, 
uh, as well as a wide range of clinical po populations, including low-functioning ASC who might not be able to perform tasks that we might be interested in. Secondly, many people have shown that these uh, resting state networks are fairly reliable, robust, but also importantly, they're plastic. And um, that means that we can actually look at how pharmacological and behavioral interventions modulate these intrinsic net networks. And finally, they're very easy to acquire and share large data sets. Randy Buckner has um, obviously done this a lot, as, as well as many other people. Um, and of course, now uh, NIH has funded a number of human connectome projects where many people are acquiring resting state data as well as diffusion data and sharing uh, these data sets. And that's really important because it's key for making reliable models. So we know there's many, many different resting state networks, but today I'll talk about initially the default mode network and its relation to psychopathology. So um, for many years, scientists would uh, use neuroimaging to identify which regions of the brain are more active for a particular task relative to rest or baseline. And you might imagine if you were to flip the question and say, what regions of the brain are more active during rest? When the subject's mental processes are completely unconstrained, you may be still pondering about the election. You may still be thinking about uh, global warming. Everybody's um, thinking about perhaps something different. But what Mark Rakel and colleagues showed here in 2001 is that the regions of the brain that are more active during rest relative to a wide variety of attention to many tasks are remarkably similar. And the primary regions of those um, brain networks are in the medial prefrontal cortex, PCC, precuneus, lateral parietal, as well as hippocampus formation, as Randy Buckner has mentioned before. So 14 years and 3,000 paper, DMM papers later, um, Buckner, I'm um, sorry, Rachel had a really nice review of the DMM, and in this he had a figure of a graph analysis showing all of the papers who had uh, referenced his first paper, and what you'll see here in the cluster in blue are all the papers that were DMN specific, and in terms of um, um, DMN relations to uh, any kind of psychiatric disorders. So we're really interested in looking at an empirical investigation of the default mode network as well as the self-reference network um, using the same subjects in the same baseline. And so what we did here was an experiment where we had a self-reference task, and so each subject saw a series of, of trait adjectives, and the task was to decide whether the ad adjective described him or herself. That was a self-reference condition. We also had a baseline semantic condition, and that was just is the trait adjective positive or negative. And then we had a rest condition, just a very simple three-condition task. And what we did was a conjunction analysis, and we asked which areas of the brain are more active for self greater than semantic and rest greater than semantic. And it was precisely the two core medial hubs of the DMN, namely the medial prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate, um, that were more active for self-referential processing as well as the default mode. So one might infer then that if you have a functional pathology in the MPFC and PCC and various psychiatric disorders, that might mean that there's a functional pathology in self-referential processing. We also know that in the healthy brain, the greater suppression of the DMN is associated with better memory formation, increased task difficulty, fewer lapses of attention, better learning of a cognitive skill, less mind wandering, which should make you happier. So the I general idea is that the more of these regions are suppressed, the better one can focus on the external world and the better one can perform a task. Now I've talked about the DMN in terms of task suppression, but you can also elucidate the exact same network with um, resting state connectivity, in other words, resting state correlations. So uh, Randy already showed this beautiful iconic slide from Fox 2005 where he had subjects just lying in the scanner, and what he did was he placed a seed in the posterior cingulate, and he looked at the functional correlations of every other voxel in the brain to that seed, you're th seeing a thresholded R map at 0.3. And so regions that are anatomically far apart, like the medial prefrontal cortex, um, are actually highly synchronized to the posterior cingulate. So if you were to pluck out the time series of the MPFC and PCC uh, accordingly, you would see um, that they're practically superimposed here in orange and yellow. Even though th the subjects are not actually performing a task, you actually get um, a task positive network for free, the dorsal attention central executive regions in blue. And these regions are negatively correlated or anti-correlated to the default mode network. And it turns out that the magnitude of these anti-correlations are actually really relevant in many ways to neuropsychiatric diseases. And today I'll be focusing on specifically the anti-correlations of the medial prefrontal cortex and the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So we and others have shown that the degree of anti-correlation between the MPFC and DLPFC is related to executive function, speed of processing, IQ. Um, here what we did was we plucked uh, a seed in the medial prefrontal cortex, and then we looked at the uh, 
cluster that in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, looked at the connectivity measures in that cluster, and then correlated it with a complex working memory O span. And what we found was the more the MPFC and DLPFC were negatively or anti-correlated, the better people did on working memory. So now we know that the um, DMN is related to self referential processing, especially at two core medial hubs. We also know it's related to executive function. So now let's turn to some pathology. Let's start with schizophrenia. We know schizophrenia is a psychiatric disorder characterized by disturbances of thought, perception, and emotion, as well as neurocognitive deficits, and we know that there's a genetic basis for it. So uh, one of our earlier studies, we looked at patients with early schizophrenic, uh, schizophrenia, and uh, this was to minimize the potential compounds due to chronic medication. We also had first-degree relatives of patients with schizophrenia, which really offers a unique opportunity to look at the risk genes, the behavior, and brain without the complexity of the disease. And of course, we had um, age-matched uh, controls, gender-matched, sex-matched IQ. So what we found was um, hyperconnectivity of the uh, MPFC and PCC, again, these self-reference nodes, um, such that the patients with schizophrenia and the relatives had more hyperconnectivity, um, more connectivity in these nodes relative to the controls, both the MPFC and PCC. Moreover, the degree of MPFC and PCC coupling positively correlated with the global symptom score of psychopathology as measured by the SAPS. In other words, the more these regions were functionally correlated during rest, the more pathology the patients had. They could be engaged in paranoid ideation or rumination, but they're somehow hijacked and they have more pathology. But we were also interested in looking at the DMN anticorrelations. So we used the same MPFC seed, and then we looked at the anticorrelations both during rest and task, and we see that the controls have a nice healthy anticorrelation, but there's a monotonic decrease in the level of anticorrelations from MPFC to DLPFC, from controls to relatives to patients, where there is really none. Uh, if you do an ANOVA, what we found was it was a precisely in the right DLPFC BA46, where the controls had a significantly more anticorrelation with the MPFC and DLPFC than the relatives and patients. Um, we also found that um, the MPFC DLPFC anticorrelations, again, related to executive function. We knew that the patients and the relatives perform worse, so it's not surprising that they don't have um, the anticorrelations there. So in conclusion here, what we found is that we have increased positive correlations in the self-reference nodes of the DMN, and that really relates to psychopathology. We also see that there's a significant decrease in the MPFC-DLPFC anticorrelation, which relates to cognitive impairment. So we have some kind of functional dissociation of the DMN pathology. Positive correlations go with psychopathology, negative uh, correlations go with cognitive impairment. So this study actually has been replicated many times. I'll just tell you about two. One was um, by Shim and colleagues, which was um, published a year after the PNAS um, paper that I just told you about. And they found the exact same thing, but with individuals who had ultra high risk for psychosis. And they also found hyperconnectivity of the DMN as well as a reduction of DMN anticorrelations. Another study that I'd like to highlight here um, is one by Alan Natasevic, where he looked at 129 early core schizophrenics, and they were all non-medicated. And again, he also saw, uh, saw the hyperconnectivity of the DMN, which I think is important there. So let's say we believe there's some kind of functional pathology of the DMN and schizophrenia. If there is, what can we do about it? What if we can do a behavioral intervention? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we do real-time fMRI neurofeedback and, and uh, tell you about an experiment where we tried to do real-time fMRI neurofeedback um, to modulate the DMN and schizophrenia. The general idea here is that we have subjects lying in the scanner. We functional localize an independent uh, set of regions, and then we extract the bold signal, we analyze it quickly, and then we display it back. There's a number of different displays being displayed. And then we train the subjects with various techniques to modulate the brain region or correlations of those regions. And we've done that with the motor cortex, with normal controls, um, we've done that with other um, ACC and chronic pain patients, but we've never done it with schizophrenia patients. But now we're trying to do that. So what we've done here is we've isolated, we did a functional localizer of the DLPFC as well as the MPFC. And the goal here is we want to train the people to upregulate the DLPFC while downregulated the MPFC. In other words, we want to maximize kind of this anti-correlation. And in order to do that, what we do to suppress the DMN is we train them to do a mindfulness meditation technique called the noting practice. What you see here to the left is the bold response here in purple is a DLPFC, 
and green is the MPFC. So you can track the bulb response here. This is what the experimenter is seeing. To the right over here, you see what the feedback is, is displayed to the subject. So the subject, basically, the patient has a game. The game is such that you have a white ball, and you move the ball up into, the goal is to move the ball up into this yellow circle. And the way you move the ball is by increasing your DLPFC activation and decreasing your DMN activation. And the hop size of the, um, the ball is basically um, proportional to the magnitude of the difference between the DLPFC and MPFC. If it turns out that the patient has a bad brain state, in other words, the DMN is high and the DLPFC is low, um, the ball is going to be going in the wrong direction and will go into the blue. So this is the game that they're playing. And they're not very good at it at first, not surprising. But I'm going to um, show you, hopefully, a movie where um, this is just one example of a patient who was not able to do it at all, but after four runs was actually able to do it quite well. Let's see if I can do this. So here we're tracking, again, the DLPFC and MPFC. You can see he's, sh he's now pushing up the ball. And if you can get it into the circle, it will dynamically shrink to make it more difficult. And there he goes. And you can see the difference between the purple DLPFC and the green MPFC. He's actually able to pull apart the executive function and the DMN, which is quite shocking. And they, they love this. They, have, they, they love it. They feel that they have control over the brain. Um, and what's more interesting is that we did a uh, pure rest scan prior to this training, uh, prior and post to this training. And what we found, not surprisingly, prior to the real-time training was we found hyperconnectivity of the DMN, which did correlate with auditory hallucinations. Um, we also found reduced DMN anticorrelations. But after this training for a number of sessions, there was a significant reduction in the DMN connectivity as well as a significant increase in the MPFC, D DLPFC anticorrelation. In other words, the pathology was normalized. In addition to that, we actually uh, had a significant um, reduction in symptoms such as auditory hallucinations. And the magnitude of the DMN uh, connectivity uh, reduction significantly related to uh, the magnitude of the reduction of auditory hallucinations. So this gives us some hope that maybe uh, the DMN is plastic, and maybe um, if it can be modulated by such behavioral interventions, uh, it could offer hope that patients could mitigate their symptoms and potentially even augment their cognitive um, function. We know that a lot of antipsychotics really address positive symptoms, leaving alone the negative symptoms, and certainly not cogn cognition. So if we can augment or even sometimes replace some other behavioral or um, therapies that could actually not only reduce the positive symptoms but potentially increase cognition, that could be quite promising. So let's shift gears a little bit to depression. We, um, this is a, a nice uh, finding by Mike Grishas, where he showed that there's a hyperconnectivity of the DMN with the subgenual ACC. We know the subgenual ACC is very relevant for depression, fewer glial cells, um, less metabolism. We know of all of Helen Mayberg's work of doing um, deep brain stimulation, uh, as well as Mike Fox's work where he does TMS to the maximal anticorrelated region of the subgenual. So the subgenual is definitely related to, to um, depression. We know that this is a beautiful example of, of what happens with people with major depression. Uh, but we were interested in the question, does this DMN pathology and depression reflect the state of depression or a neurobiological trait? So we wanted to follow up. And what we did was we looked at children, um, 30 children, ages 8 to 14, who were not diagnosed with any disorder. They were not medicated. But they were a child of a parent with a major depression. And we know a child of a parent with major depression has a 3 to 5 increased risk for developing major depression. We also looked at a behavioral measure called CBCL. This is a child behavioral checklist. Um, and in that, um, there's a scale called internalization, which is a combination or a union of anxiety and depression with drawn and somatic symptoms. And so what we did was we basically looked at the DMN with the two self-reference nodes. And what we found was the at-risk children had hyperconnectivity of the DMN to the subgenual. This is not mass, so exactly the hyperconnectivity of the DMN to the subgenual relative to the controls. In addition, the degree of connectivity between the DMN and subgenual positively correlated with increased internalization. So these children are not sick. They are not diagnosed with, uh, with, with anything. They just have a, a parent um, with MDD. Yet we see a similar profile as adults with MDD. We did a logistic regression, and we found that um, classification between the at-risk and control subjects uh, based on the resting state yielded higher accuracy and sensitivity and specificity relative to the CBCL measures. Um, so that's all fine and good. But we would like to take this one step further, 
um, it would be really ideal if we could do a longitudinal, a prospective <laughs> longitudinal study um, with individuals who are not necessarily tagged or at clinical or genetically at risk and see if we can actually find uh, resting state biomarkers that would predict subsequent behavior. So I will show you another slide. This is very recent data. This is in a collaboration with Sylvia Bunga from um, Berkeley and Lori Cutting. And what we're doing here is we're basically um, tracking 94 uh, individuals um, from seven years of age, and then we track them each year, actually, um, until four years. So we track them from seven years to 11 years. And what I found here is that the stronger the, the uh, time point one at seven years, um, DMN subgenual correlation predicted a worsening of internalization four years later. And a weaker T1 at age seven, MPFC, DLPFC anti-correlation predicted a worsening of attentional problem four years later. So here again, these individuals were not selected as being clinically or genetically at risk, but yet we were able to find resting state biomarkers that would predict a worsening of behavior either in psychopathology or attention. So that could promote perhaps early intervention in terms of behavioral interventions. So um, I'll wrap up for the final uh, topic is um, neuroprediction. So here we looked at social anxiety. We know that social anxiety is characterized by intense anxiety in social situations. Um, surprisingly, it's one of the most common psychiatric conditions and it can be chronic and disabling. And what we did was we had, um, well, first of all, there's two treatments for SAD or social anxiety. Um, the standard treatments, cognitive behavioral therapy or pharmacology. And although such treatments are superior to placebo, on average, there's no reliable predictor of treatment response that has ever been identified. So in this example, we have 39 medicated free patients with social anxiety and 37 match controls. And the patients, with CB, uh, the patients received 12 weeks of CBT. And what we did was we used fMRI task, diffusion-weighted imaging, and resting state um, to see if we could uh, predict who would respond. And our outcome measure here is a clinical scale called LSAS, the Leibovitz Social Anxiety Scale. So we have anxiety measures on them. For the F fMRI task activation, we were looking at the activation of angry to neutral faces. For the diffusion-weighted imaging, we were looking at um, the inferior longitudinal fasciculus here. And for the resting state fMRI, we wanted to do two different things. We wanted to do a hypothesis C-driven based on bilateral anatomically defined amygdala. And we also wanted to do a more agnostic data-driven multivoxel pattern analysis. So these were all the different analyses we did to predict outcome. So the these are in two different studies. The um, first thing we needed to note was that the initial severity of anxiety measured by LSAS already accounted for 12% of the treatment variance. In other words, one question is, does brain imaging add anything to this? It may be the case that people already have, that the clinicians already have enough information with CBCL and other things, um, and anxiety that they already know who is going to um, succeed with the CBT. However, what we found was, um, when we did the fMRI task activation, that there was a cluster in the occipital temporal region um, where the more activation in that cluster to angry versus neutral faces positively predicted um, better change or, or better uh, change in anxiety. And so when we uh, combined the fMRI activation in that cluster with the initial anxiety of LSAS, we went from 12% uh, variance um, to 40% of variance accounted for in treatment response. So that was really nice in terms of fMRI, you know, bolstering the treatment response. But I was really interested in getting away from fMRI task and going more towards an intrinsic connectivity, both either by resting state or diffusion weighted, because I realized that we can again move towards earlier, earlier, younger um, uh, people, even into infants. So here, um, these are the same subjects, but a different study. We decided to do a bilateral amygdala seed, and we chose the amygdala because it's the most common brain locus of dysfunction of social anxiety. But one point that I think is, a, is kind of important and curious is that the brain regions that are associated with the path pathophysiology of your disorder may not be the same brain regions that predict outcome. So when we were looking at the fMRI task activation, we were assuming it's amygdala, it's amygdala, amygdala will predict. Amygdala had no prediction value whatsoever in the fMRI task activation. So because of that, we decided to um, try the bilateral amygdala but we also wanted to do an agnostic data-driven approach with a multivoxel pattern analysis. So we did both of those resting state. We also wanted to look at the intrinsic um, uh, diffusion-weighted imaging, and we did Anastasia's um, tracula to look at the white matter integrity, the inf inferior longitudinal fasciculus. And what we found was that higher FA of this white matter tract predicted better um, outcome in CBT. 
So what we found was um, the initial LSAS accounted for, again, only 12% of treatment response. And as we um, added more and more um, imaging predictors, you can see the fusion added a little bit more. The resting state um, basically kind of for 50% of the treatment response. But when you put in all the multimodal predictors together, combining these intrinsic connectivity measures with the initial severity accounted for 60% of the variance, which is a five-fold improvement. So basically, we've talked uh, about uh, how we can use um, resting state in terms of early identification, which could potentially, uh, you know, uh, promote early uh, intervention and possibly even prevention of a disorder. We talked about how we might be able to use resting state in terms um, of neuroprediction, which would lead towards precision medicine. And we also talked about potential novel therapies. So I'll leave you with a question. In the future, could fMRI facilitate a path for children to get help before they are in crisis through early identification? get treated more effectively with better precision to avail for therapies, and provide options for novel therapies. And um, many of us talked about the fact that Jack really wanted to change the world. I really believe that with fMRI and Jack and all of your inven invention with the fMRI could actually really, really change the world in helping people um, avoid a lot of psychiatric um, problems. So I wanted to thank the inventors of fMRI and all of the MGH community, as well as all of my clinical colleagues and all of the colleagues who have um, contributed to the study. So thank you. Thank you.